How crazy should a person have to be before they're denied the right to legally purchase a firearm in the USA? Because let me tell you something, what needs to happen, if I made a YouTube video, like I'm making right now, with my gun holding up on the airs like this, saying that I'm going to go on a rampage and kill everybody who rejected me, I would hope that the police would be at my door and that they would take away my weapons. Well, greetings viewers and voyeurs, you have got that funk. And hello Mr. Epsion, it's been a while since I've sent you a video response, I hope you've been doing well, man. And just like you said to Jacqueline Glenn in your video, uh, Daniel, there's no antagonism uh, coming from me towards you, far from it. As far as I'm concerned, this is just about a conversation. I think uh, in the comment section of your video, we tried to speak to one another, but I think we're actually talking past each other, mate. And um, I wanted to reach out to sort of face-to-face, -face, flesh out what I was trying to say a little bit, so that hopefully we can come to a better understanding of one another's point of view. Now, Daniel, uh, this might sound a bit flippant, and I apologize for that, but let's just say for the sake of argument that you personally, Daniel Solzbach, have been... Uh, endowed with the authority to determine how mentally ill someone has to be before they're denied the right to legally purchase a firearm in the USA. Now Daniel, in your video you showed a piece of paper with your diagnoses on it uh, showing that you have certain mental illnesses uh, among them being anxiety and depression. And you also showed in the same bit of the video the fact that you've got a pistol. So I think it's fair for us to assume that you don't think depression is a mental illness which is uh, sufficient to deny you the right to have that gun. Okay, Daniel, I want to ask you in all seriousness, why not? Why is depression not sufficiently mentally ill? What is it about depression that doesn't exist in other mental illnesses that make it too, that, that, that are too mentally ill, for you, in your opinion, to own a gun? Now, I would like to go through a list of different mental conditions, not an exhaustive list, so don't worry, but just a, just a few. And I would like you to tell me whether you think people who have been diagnosed with this, uh, these conditions should or should not be allowed to purchase firearms legally in the USA. What if someone has acute paranoia? Yes or no? Should they be allowed to buy guns? What if someone is bipolar? What if someone has borderline personality disorder? What if someone has schizophrenia, they hear voices in their head? What if someone has the kind of schizophrenia where they have multiple personality disorder? What if someone has histrionic personality disorder? What if someone is a pathological narcissist? These are just a few conditions that I can list right off the top of my head without even looking into them. Um, which some people would probably say, yeah, we shouldn't let that person have a gun. But what do you say, Daniel? Let's just, let's just put it up to you. Let's make you the boss on this one, okay? Now here's a really hard one for you. What if someone has post-traumatic stress disorder? This disorder doesn't only affect uh, veterans coming back from battle, but largely, to a pretty large degree, a lot of people who come back having seen active service uh, abroad in combat uh, will come back with PTSD. Should we be denying these people the right to legally own and, and uh, a gun? If so, that would be kind of ironic because they've been trained how to use firearms and they serve the country, uh, the, upholding the Constitution. So, you know, um, at least ostensibly. So, you know, I think uh, it's very difficult. It, the, the, these issues are not cut and dry, mate. And why should we even be limiting it to mental illness uh, when it comes to uh, possibly confiscating weapons from people? Okay, because let's say, for example, someone has been arrested for um, domestic violence against their partner. Be it a man or a woman, uh, if, if they beat the crap out of their partner, um, should the police be coming to that residence and uh, making sure there's no firearms present so that uh, any future possible outbreaks of domestic violence don't have guns involved? I think it's a fair question. Now, Daniel, in the clip that I just played from your video, um, you seem to think that uh, if someone makes uh, threatening statements on the internet, 
or I suppose in public, um, that the police should be coming around their house and confiscating their firearms. And Daniel, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to use a word I hate to use towards you, but that's retarded, man! Um, don't you see the problem with that, Daniel? You of all people, I mean, come on, mate. Let me, let me put it to you this way. How many times on an average week, you've been on YouTube for way longer than me, and you've also got a significant presence on Tumblr and uh, Twitter and elsewhere, uh, social media. So how many times per week on average, Daniel, do people make threatening statements towards you on the Internet? Maybe not to the point of threatening your life, but threatening you with uh, serious misfortune or, or some kind of physical violence. How many times per week does that happen to you, one person on the internet? All right? Are you seriously suggesting that all those people who make those types of comments should get a knock on the door from the police to see if they're armed? Are you fucking kidding me? If you times that by not just you as one person, but times that by all the people on the internet, and all the people making these kinds of threatening statements on the internet. We would need a separate police force just for that, much less every other crime that gets committed. Furthermore, why should we be knocking on anybody's door and disarming the populace because of making threatening statements? As difficult as it is for us to stomach this notion, it's worth pointing out, I think, that the police do not exist to prevent crimes from happening. I'm going to say that again. The police are not there to prevent crimes from happening. The police are there to apprehend criminals after a crime has been committed. Uh, the presumption of innocence is absolutely fundamental in a free and fair society. And unless you have uh, been proven in court to have committed a crime, the government and its agents the police force in this case, are required to assume that no crime has been committed. Um, that's really, really, really important. So Daniel, when I said we shouldn't shred the Constitution when we want to get the guns out of the hands of nutters, I wasn't necessarily talking about the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms. I'm more talking about due process. You know, unless you've been committed of a crime, the cops have no business interfering with your life whatsoever. At all. Um, so, yeah, that's really, really, really important. It's not the Second Amendment I'm concerned about here, Daniel. It's the Fourth Amendment. The right to be secure in your person and your property and effects to be secure from search and seizure without probable cause to suspect that a crime has been committed, not might be committed. The second we start arresting people for what they might do, we live in a totalitarian society. You've got to be kidding me, man. That, that's not only unworkable, but it's anti-democracy, Daniel. That's what I was trying to talk about. I'm not talking about the right to bear arms. Now, I'm sure that we would both agree, you and me and virtually any sane person should agree, that we should do whatever we can do to make sure that people who are uh, homicidally insane don't have access to firearms. But the question isn't that whether we should do something or not. The question is, what can we do? What can we do? How can we do this? How can we make sure that the nutters don't get guns, but everybody else who wants to use their guns responsibly, or just as a deterrent against, a, you know, a protective measure against being um, victimized? How can we assure that those people still have their right to their firearms, uh, but the crazies don't? It's not straightforward. I, I honestly don't think there's any kind of a questionnaire that you could devise. Uh, you can be as clever with psycholinguistics as you want to be. I don't think there's any kind of questionnaire that you can give to gun shop owners and people running gun shows and so forth uh, that, that, that they can give their customers that a shrewd customer couldn't fill out in such a way as to make sure that they were still able to obtain their firearm if that's what they wanted. Just like when you fill out a job application, Daniel, you know how to answer the questions in such a way, whether your answers are true or not, it's irrelevant, you know how to answer the questions in such a way that makes you the most likely, uh, to, to most likely be able to get what you want, i.e. an interview or whatever. And the same is true with any kind of, any kind of questionnaire. I don't care how clever the questionnaire is, it's not going to show whether or not someone is going to uh, go on a killing spree, certainly. Um, you know, I mean, when the police did visit Elliot Roger, uh, he played it cool, and uh, they basically left, not because 
um, you know, uh, they didn't take seriously what he said in his social media, but because basically he didn't seem to be crazy on the outside. He played he a good act, and, and it worked. You know, you can't blame the cops for that. It's, you know, <sighs> this idea that you seem to have that the cops should be coming around and knocking on people's doors to prevent them from committing murder is both absurd and dangerous thinking, Daniel. We should not be investing the authorities with that kind of power. That 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 way is it, on the direct road to totalitarianism. Okay, we cannot do that. That's just not sound. As far as the point about getting guns out of crazy people's hands is concerned, the question really is how do we do it? Uh, I would actually argue that um, rather than making it harder for people to get guns, uh, we should be making it harder for people to um, be crazy, I suppose. We should be trying to fix the aspects of our culture which make these types of events happen. Okay, um, This is not a simple issue at all. I'll give you an example. Um, in Switzerland, I'm pretty sure I read that 85%, 17 out of every 20 households have automatic weapons and their murder rate by uh, guns is a tiny fraction of what it is in America. I mean, I think it's less like 0.02% per capita or something like that of what it is in America. It's, it's not even comparable. So it's not the availability of guns that makes people do the kinds of things they do with guns in America. It's something about us. We got to look into our culture and try to fix that. And there's no amount of legislation that can fix culture. Individuals have to do it as a movement. And I think this is a, a, a good example of where the internet can be a, a, a tool for the good of our society. Because by having conversations like the ones we're having, uh, we can hopefully try to uh, make some sort of consensus occur, sort of organically. Um, last but not least, I wanted to make this point, Daniel. Let's just say that the questionnaire idea can't work, okay? The only alternative to that that I can think of um, in terms of identifying who's too crazy to own a weapon would be if healthcare professionals were obligated to tell the authorities when someone was diagnosed with a mental illness which was on a list of dangerous mental illnesses. If your list, Daniel, the one that you come up with. Um, but if you don't see the problem with that, I'll go ahead and explain it uh, just in case. But the problem with that kind of situation is you would be turning the mental health, the healthcare professionals away from serving their patients and instead they would be serving the authorities. All right. Um, patient confidentiality is absolutely crucial for several reasons. Chief among those reasons being it gives people a reason to come forward and talk openly and honestly about their issues so they can seek the help that they need. If people are afraid that going to the doctor about their mental health issues might get them arrested or suspected that they might commit a crime, they're not going to go. They're not going to get the treatment they need, possibly the medication they need or counseling or whatever they need and they're actually going to be more dangerous, not less dangerous, okay? Because an undiagnosed person with a mental illness could easily get a gun. Um, you know, so, so it's, the whole thing is just is just bonkers, man. I'll tell you what, though, if the questionnaire idea um, uh, you don't think would work, just like I don't think it would work, and if you can see the problems with healthcare professionals having to narc on their patients, fine. Give me a third option, Daniel. Tell me another way that we can identify how crazy people are crazy and how we can keep them from getting guns prior to the fact. Let's just assume that there's no black market in guns and just talk about legal purchases, okay? Let's just assume that's the case. Give me an answer. Help me out here. I would love to hear your solution to this. How can we do it without shredding the Constitution, without violating due process? Yeah, how can we do that? How can we how can we do it without violating the principle that a person is innocent of a crime until proven guilty of that crime in court? These are serious questions, and I would very much like a serious response. I don't necessarily expect you to do me a video, Daniel, but a lengthy comment or two down below uh, would be very very much appreciated. All right. I want to thank you all for coming along on the Goth Out Funk Express for this particular ride. I hope it hasn't been too bumpy. Until next time, may all your ups and downs be ups.